This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. UN probe reveals crimes against humanity and war crimes committed in Libya since 2016. Abiy Ahmed begins a five-year term in office after being sworn in as Ethiopia's prime minister. And the UN chief highlights the benefits of greener cities as the world commemorates Habitat's Day. Welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. We'll bring you the details of those stories in just a moment. But first, here's Ramanyang with the day's business headlines. Rama. That's right, Beatrice. It's what's coming up in the next 30 minutes. Zimbabwe Central Bank has revised its year-end inflation outlook forecast upwards amidst a rise in global commodity prices and a rapidly weakening currency. And Egyptian state-owned banks have launched a $65 million fund designed to support fintech startups and to expand financial inclusion. We'll have the details on those stories and lots more coming your way in the course of the hour. For now, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And we begin in Libya, where investigators commissioned by the United Nations top human rights body say they have turned up evidence of possible war crimes and crimes against humanity in Libya. The body says the probe found that in particular... Crimes were committed against civilians and migrants who crossed the restive North African country trying to get to Europe, but ended up being detained in horrific conditions. Their crimes include murder, torture, enslavement, extrajudicial killings and rape. The Libyan government has not responded to the claims. The Norwegian Refugee Council says it believes up to 5,000 migrants could have been detained in a major arrest campaign in Libya since Friday. Through its Libyan advocacy manager, Alexandra Saya, the agency says it believes a major operation by Libyan police forces has resulted in the detention of the migrants. The raids started on Friday in the western town of Garadesh as part of what authorities described as a security campaign against illegal migration and drug trafficking. The Libyan interior ministry led the crackdown. The ministry has, however, made no mention of any traffickers or smugglers being arrested. According to the United Nations, at least one young migrant was shot dead and 15 others injured during the arrests. This is the largest uh, crackdown on migrants in Libya that we've seen in recent years. This is not the first time that there have been large numbers of arrests. Uh, we've seen this happen a bit in a smaller scale over the last few weeks and months. And over the course of the last year, there were upwards of 5,000 uh, migrants and refugees in Libyan detention centers at a time. So th this is not a new practice, uh, but certainly these are the biggest numbers that we've seen in a single 24-hour, 36-hour period. Well, let's bring in Sarah Kira, a political analyst and director of the European North African Center for Research, for more on this uh, developing story. Sarah, thank you for joining us on the program. Now, according to the UN report, it seems... EU efforts to work with Libyan authorities to improve conditions in the detention centers have so far been ineffective. What happened to plans last year to close the centers most notorious for abuse? First of all, hello, good evening, and thank you for having me. Uh, well, the EU hasn't been the only player uh, in the playground open in Libya for the past 10 years. On the contrary, the EU is the only superpower who tried to make up for what I like to call uh, the NATO strike mistake. Um, even though the EU is not the only as well a, 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 a key factor in the NATO, and the EU is the, the biggest uh, price payer uh, for the Libyan uh, crisis, especially for the uh, topic that you mentioned, the migrants. Uh, the EU has suffered a lot of that, and it hasn't only been the only key player. Yet, the U.S. is, uh, 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 is like 
taking herself out of the equation and of the suffering of the EU, especially on the migration issues. And we have witnessed in the Trump administration how tension the discussions and the negotiations were when, when it comes to migration, discussing that with the EU counterparts of the US, and it's still as it is today. So in your view, though, the EU is not the only key player here, but former detainees are on record as saying they felt abandoned by the international community and saw little choice but to keep trying to cross the Mediterranean to Europe, often restarting the cycle of interception, detention and abuse. Do you share the opinion, though, that the international community has abandoned the migrants? I do actually share this opinion, and yes, migrants haven't had uh, the necessary efforts by the international community. Uh, unfortunately, like today, the UN report is, 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 is very big evidence on that. Only today, after a decade of cr a crisis, a bloody crisis in Libya and in Syria, only like uh, two months away or less than two months away from the presidential elections, we witnessed such a report. And if that says anything, it says that, yes, the international community knows for sure that there has been a humanitarian crisis in Libya. And another political uh, 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 analysis might go with that report is that it's trying to interfere somehow in the path of the elections next December in Libya. Maybe it's one way to say, uh, uh, of course, a US voice, we don't want uh, uh, another uh, 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 Haftar uh, uh, in the presidency of Libya. So when you take a look at the humanitarian crisis, and you take a look on the political situation and the superpowers who right. had a, a, a hand and a, 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 of course a big hand or proxy wars in Libya and everyone had his own geopolitical interest I would agree that the international community hasn't exerted enough efforts in the past 10 years for the sake of migration to solve the migration crisis and migrants coming especially from Africa to Europe and so we all know how the conditions are so this uh, whole question of the migrants going into Europe and crossing the Mediterranean Sea has been a long-standing issue. How do you see this issue being resolved? Well, uh, this, uh, this issue regarding the EU, you mean? I mean, regarding the uh, migrants crossing through the Mediterranean. Uh, okay, as I told you, the EU is the, is the big sufferer, the big superpower who suffered from interfering in Libya through the NATO strike. Big deal. The EU has really suffered big deal. We have seen a lot of migrants, dead children, uh, uh, all kinds of people and all kinds of immigrants from different crises in the region coming across the Mediterranean to where? To Europe. Europe has tried to deal with the situation, but the, in the intensity of the crisis that hit Europe because of the crisis in, on the other shore of the Mediterranean and the political situation in the other shore uh, of the Mediterranean, it has affected the domestic problems and it has uh, affected the domestic situation in uh, uh, the EU. We have seen a whole rise of what's called xenophobia today or the fear of other people and other nationalities. We have seen migrants in very bad conditions on the shores or in camps or, uh, or, or in, in center areas. We, we are witnessing a huge humanitarian crisis because of all the problems happening on the other shore of the Mediterranean. So yes, the EU will still deal with it. And of course, we have a lot of ways. The EU has a lot of humanitarian uh, uh, um, crews helping out migrants in the Mediterranean. Yes, right. it's not enough yet as we know, it's uh, uh, dealing with Egypt who has, who has set a very good example in 
uh, uh, making the migrants using the Egyptian borders less. Yes, that's another way. But still and still, the political resolution of conflicts on the other shore of the Mediterranean is the only key solution for the EU to come over this crisis. All right. Sarah Kira joining us there from Cairo with that update. Thank you. Now, after months of legal disputes, Libya's top legislative rival bodies met to discuss the country's election laws. Representatives of the Eastern-based Parliament and the Western-based High Council of State met in Morocco. But after two days of talks, the two sides are yet to reach any agreement, putting the election roadmap at risk. The UN wants to see the elections held in December. Adil Mahoui with the details. Libya's rival legislative bodies discussed the legal framework for the December 24 elections in Morocco. The two-day meeting saw representatives of the eastern-based Libyan parliament and the western-based High Council of State hold a rare meeting. The two sides have differed strongly on the parliamentary and presidential election law, which defines who the eligible candidates and voters are. Our delegation in Morocco informed us the negotiations were open for both the presidential election, the parliamentary election and the constitutional foundation. Unilateral issuing of any law from anyone will be challenged legally and constitutionally. If that happens again, we will go back to the 2014 events when we formed elected bodies not recognized by the entire country. The talks ended without any significant agreement. Members of parliament have refused to discuss any amendments of the presidential election law, which they unilaterally passed last month. And the High Council of State also has its concerns. The election date should not have been fixed to a date so that we could complete all constitutional procedures. Now, a referendum will not take place because time is not enough. The international community insists on that date. I think time is tight. We need to issue laws at certain times. It has become almost impossible to commit to December 24th. The Muslim Brotherhood has strong influence over the High Council of State. They don't want election laws that would stand against their victory in the vote. For instance, they want the Libyan president to be elected through parliament members instead of direct voting from the people. This can give them an opportunity to influence MPs and get the president they want. Libyan voters are diverse from different ideologies and backgrounds, while Islamist groups only want their ideologies to rule. There have been some minor agreements announced in Morocco. Libyans have encouraged the international community to monitor the upcoming elections. They want to see this done so as to ensure that everyone will accept the vote's results. A meeting that should have raised hopes of bringing Libyans together has instead exposed the depths of division over the country's laws. The Eastern-based parliament was so confident that the Morocco talks would not produce any outcome that it continued its sessions to discuss the parliamentary election laws while the talks were still ongoing. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Tunisian President Kai Saib says a national dialogue seeking to end the country's political crisis will take place soon. This is according to a statement released by the French presidency following a phone conversation between President Saeed and French President Emmanuel Macron. Here is Adnan Chauchi with the details. Several political parties and civil society organizations have expressed support for the National Dialogue Initiative led by President Saeed. We support this decision and the measurement taken by the President of the Republic, Mr. Kai Saeed, because we also called for that even before the 25th of, this, of July. Today, maybe the President has some difficulties in the communication part of his uh, work today, but we can understand that because maybe he has some problems with some political party. The opposition has, however, criticized the head of state's monopoly of powers. Many politicians say Qayyas Saeed is relying on foreign support to impose his rule and his one-sided vision of the process of national dialogue. 
We reject any form of foreign interference in Tunisian affairs. However, the president has opened the door for foreign states to interfere. He is meeting foreign ministers of foreign countries and their parliamentary delegations to explain his moves and the current situation while he refuses to meet all his Tunisian supporters and opponents. This is not the right approach to starting a national dialogue. Political analysts assert that Tunisia needs a national dialogue to end the current crisis. However, this initiative needs to involve all political parties, civil society organizations, as well as labor unions, national figures and constitutional law experts. Many Tunisian parties and national organizations have been calling for national dialogue, but they have learned about the project in the communique of the Elysee instead of the Tunisian presidency. The president discussed this issue with French President Macron. This is the second time that Tunisians learn about internal politics through the French presidency. This is unacceptable for Tunisia's sovereignty. Analysts maintain that the Tunisian president brushed aside much of the 2014 constitution. Ayasaid has also given himself powers to legislate by decree. Said appointed a new prime minister and said he will form a committee to amend the constitution. More than 90 frozen MPs have signed a petition calling for the resumption of the activities of the House of the People's representatives. President Sayed suspended parliament and lifted MPs' immunity in July. Experts assert that these decisions are against any political dialogue initiative in the country. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has been sworn into office for a five-year term. Abiy Ahmed took the oath of office that was administered by the Supreme Court Chief Justice Meaza Ashenafi on Monday. That's following similar oaths taken by the Speaker and the Deputy Speaker of Parliament's lower house. Abiy's Prosperity Party was declared the winner of parliamentary elections in July, which were boycotted by some opposition parties. The Prime Minister's Prosperity Party won 410 out of the 436 parliamentary seats that were contested. CGTN's Girum Chala has been following the day's events from the capital, Addis Ababa. This morning, the Ethiopian newest parliament has seen the inaugural ceremony and the swearing-in ceremony of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. He has got a new five years term after his party, Prosperity Party, won the majority of the seats uh, in uh, the parliament. Uh, this afternoon, we have seen another program uh, where heads of state of different countries have also attended and thousands of people came, uh, uh, who came uh, across uh, the country have attended uh, an another ceremony where the Prime Minister delivered a speech. Uh, in the speech he said he promised that he will address the peace and security situation in the northern part of the country, the economic situation of the country. He promised more growth for the country and also uh, promised to fight corruption and other issues were also raised in his speech. Other leaders have also delivered a speech, Uhuru Kenyatta of Kenya, uh, Mohamed Buhari of Nigeria, Maki Sal of Senegal and others, and the event was really colorful. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. British soldiers begin delivering petrol amid a fuel shortage. And UN chief highlights the benefits of greener cities as the world commemorates Habitat Day. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Adnan Shirishi, Tunis, Cairo, Juba, Johannesburg, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice.
British soldiers began delivering petrol on Monday amid a fuel shortage. Around 200 troops were deployed to relieve a lack of truck drivers that's affected everything from petrol to food and medicine. Meanwhile, a few dozen climate protesters blocked a major tunnel in London, causing a gridlock. They want the government to commit to providing insulation to millions of homes. A fifth of petrol stations in the southeast of England are without fuel. The Prime Minister warns shortages could last until Christmas. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas met Israeli ministers on Sunday night, the second high-profile meeting between the sides in recent months. Israeli officials say discussions focused on keeping the two-state solutions alive. Uh, CGTN Stephanie Freed has the latest. Sunday night's meeting here in Ramallah between Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and two Israeli ministers can be viewed as an effort in rebuilding bridges. Over the past decade, under Israel's Netanyahu government, there weren't public meetings between the two sides and relations deteriorated. According to local press reports, President Abbas welcomed the current initiative and extended an open invitation for meetings with all of Israel's ministers. Members of Israel's current government have pledged to strengthen ties with the Palestinian Authority despite Prime Minister Naftali Bennett's opposition to a Palestinian state and his declaration that his government will not return to the peace process. Bennett was widely criticized for failing to mention the Palestinians in his September address to the UN General Assembly. In his speech to the General Assembly, President Abbas demanded Israel withdraw within a year from Palestinian territories occupied in 1967. Stephanie Freed, CGTN, Ramallah. Sudanese authorities say the country is about to run out of essential medicine, fuel and wheat after political protests forced the closure of Port Sudan. The port is the main entry point for goods coming into the country. Naba Muhyiddin has more from Khartoum. Members of Sudan's major tribes have blocked roads and forced Red Sea ports to close in recent weeks. The region has witnessed several protests this year, condemning the lack of political power and poor economic conditions in the region. There have also been a number of tribal clashes. The protests erupted when Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok said the problems were political and fueled by the former government, aiming to undermine the transitional period. A government delegation visited the port last week and urged the protesting tribes to reopen it and the national road that links the Red Sea with other Sudanese states. The port is vital to Sudanese trade. It's considered the main port for both imports and exports and a gateway to Africa. The government is expected to issue a statement while sending delegations to continue negotiations with the protesters. Naba Muhyiddin, CGTN, Khartoum, Sudan. South Sudan has waived visa fees for Ugandans entering the country. The move follows implementation of a visa-free entry by the Ugandan government for South Sudanese citizens, which began on October the 1st. CGTN's Patrick Oyet tells us more. The visa fee waiver comes at a time when cross-border movement is finally increasing. Following the outbreak of the global COVID-19 pandemic, South Sudan's government says the move is in line with the spirit of the East African cooperation. It further says the move will promote cross-border trade. South Sudan imports lots of goods from Uganda, especially food, and many Ugandans live in South Sudan, including many traders. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of the Republic of South Sudan hailed this move as a significant booster to the already existing stronger bilateral relation with the Republic of Uganda. Many South Sudanese people take their children to Uganda for schooling. Uganda is also a host to 2.2 million South Sudanese refugees who fled civil war in the country. Uganda says the move will encourage people put off by the high cost of travel to get back to business. East African community strategic objectives are three, the main ones. One, economic integration to ensure prosperity, that is to say, 
uniting our markets. South Sudan and Uganda say they also intend to cooperate on security to ensure that there is stability. The South Sudan government also says the visa fee waiver will boost tourism and increase cultural exchanges between the two countries. Patrick Oyet, CGTN, Juba, South Sudan. The United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, is urging countries to make their cities more environmentally friendly. Guterres says that there are enormous benefits of taking this approach. This include reduced climate risk, more jobs and better health and well-being. According to UN News, cities are responsible for about 75% of the world's energy consumption and over 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The UN says urban areas across the globe are facing the dual crisis of COVID-19 and climate change. We earlier discussed the matter with Jacqueline Kimeu, the international coordinator uh, with the Alliance for, of uh, Civil Society Organizations for Clean Energy Access. Take a listen. Africa has made a great strides when it comes to addressing climate change uh, impact. Given that Africa is a receiver of climate change you know, impact, we have been affected more than the other countries because of you know, our resource base and also the economic uh, times that we are in. Countries in Africa are actually signatories to the Paris Agreement, which is a global roadmap uh, that is you know, uh, aimed at addressing the climate change uh, impact uh, globally. So, so far, all the countries in Africa have signed to that agreement, which is a step in the right direction. Second, 44 countries in Africa have developed their national determined contribution, the, what we are calling the NDCs. And the purpose of the NDCs is to, you know, develop uh, climate action uh, plans uh, to address climate change uh, issues in Africa. Africa still accounts for around 69% uh, of the energy emissions uh, you know, energy supply coming from fossil fuels. We are talking about coal, we are talking about oil and gas. These are some of the culprits uh, contributing to climate change. Yet in Africa, we have abundant supply of renewable energy. We are talking about solar, we are talking about wind, we are talking about geothermal. Yet Africa still lags behind when it comes to, you know, adopting renewable energy sources. Uh, and we can see government still, you know, uh, uh, prioritizing you know, fossil fuels like coal and others. We are saying as Access Coalition, we are saying that Africa can industrialize without, you know, fossil fuel, which is contributing to climate change. We can industrialize without, you know, with clean energy, with solar, with what, uh, you know, hydropower, with wind power and the, uh, and the rest of, you know, clean energy sources. So far, governments are really uh, also um, having great uh, strides when it comes to, incorporating renewable energy into their uh, energy supply mix uh, at the national level. Women make up a large proportion of the farming community in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but many of them are struggling to support their families due to discriminatory norms on land ownership and conflicts in the country's east. LOD Ntazuminga is a feminist who started a non-profit organization in 2004 to try and address these problems. She has helped empower many women economically. CGTN's Chris Ochamringa has that report from Kinshasa. It's a typical day for these women farmers in the Nsela neighborhood of Kinshasa. They walk many miles to fetch water for their families daily. This water source and farmland are owned by an NGO called Human Dignity, which plays a significant role in the women's livelihood. Elodine Tamuzinda founded the organization in 2004 to empower women economically. We started this idea with my colleagues when we were still in school. We used to go and dig in farms during our holidays. We kept telling our fellow youths to start engaging in productive activities because we had many cases of unwanted pregnancies in our community. LOD has won several awards for promoting female entrepreneurship in the DRC. She hails from the mineral-rich province of South Kivu in the east, where many women and children have been severely affected by conflict. Our country has widespread poverty, yet we have a lot of gold and other minerals. The people who extract those minerals are only interested in making profit. They do not support the work we do to empower women. It's very sad that we haven't benefited from our country's natural wealth. Her NGO has supported more than 50 women to earn some income. 
Before Madam Elodie started helping us, we were really suffering. Water was very difficult to get, and we were struggling to feed our families. Things are much better now. I grow vegetables and sell some in the market. Mama Elodie has helped us to start growing vegetables. She also built us a fish farm, which is run by men in our community. Elodin Tamuzinda's goal is to teach many Congolese women to engage in income-generating activities so that they can support themselves. Farming and fishing are among the economic activities that women and men living in this community of Nsele carry out thanks to the support of the NGO founded by Elodin Tamuzinda. But recent changes in weather patterns have disrupted their yields. And that has resulted in the women losing income. The managers of the NGO plan to introduce other activities to support the women making losses from farming. In a few days to come, we will start rearing pigs on the slopes of this hill to diversify the women's income. As you can see, the soil here is not very fertile. According to a global coalition that monitors agriculture, women in sub-Saharan Africa account for between 60 to 80 percent of small-scale farmers. But very few of them own land because of discriminatory social norms. That is an issue that Elodin Tamuzinda and her staff are determined to change one step at a time. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Well, let's now go to Ramanyang for a look at the day's business news, Rama. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Here's what's coming up in business. Zimbabwe Central Bank revises its year-end inflation outlook forecast higher amid a rise in global commodity prices and a weakening currency. An Egypt state-owned bank launches a $65 million fund to support fintech startups and expand financial inclusion. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen? For yourself. If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. Let's start in Zimbabwe. The central bank over there has revised its year-end inflation outlook for the third time. Reserve Bank Governor John Mungudia says that annual inflation is likely to end 2021, somewhere between 35% and 53%. That's up from the initial target of 25 to 35%. The bank's initial annual inflation forecast for the end of the year was under 15%. Now, a rise in global commodity prices, a planned increase in power prices, and a rapid weakening of the local currency against the US dollar on the parallel market and the official one too are among the top inflation drivers. Annual inflation rose in September to 51.5%. That was the first increase in around eight months. Now, what exactly do gas shortages in Europe have to do with flowers in Kenya? Well, for one, those gas shortages have boosted demand from flowers from East Africa. Even though Kenya, which is a significant producer of that commodity, is struggling to grasp that opportunity because of freight capacity constraints. Soaring gas prices are eating into the margins of greenhouses in the Netherlands and elsewhere in Europe. Some producers are now cutting their growing season short to cut back on their fuel bills. And that in turn is forcing buyers to look for alternatives. And where do they turn to? East Africa. Kenya's horticultural exports, including fruits, vegetables and flowers, are worth about $1.4 billion last year, according to industry data. Comparable exports from Ethiopia were worth about $530 million in the fiscal year that ended on the 7th of July. Kenyan producers supply roughly a quarter of the cut flowers sold in Europe. Roughly 70% of Kenya's produce goes through Amsterdam by air. 
Vehicle sales in South Africa continued their recovery in September, up nearly 16% to over 43,000 units. That increase was above the Bureau for Economic Research's consensus expectation of 12%. That said, exports are still affected by the impact of the civil unrest in July and a cyber attack on Transnet support operations. In September 2020, over 20,000 vehicles were exported. By comparison, just over 12,000 units were exported a year later. According to South Africa's Automotive Business Council, there was a recovery in new vehicle sales that was helped by a relaxation of lockdown restrictions to the level two and enhanced business and consumer sentiment. On Sunday, Libya said work had started on the construction of an oil refinery in the south of the country. The project is forecast to cost anywhere between 500 to 600 million dollars. According to the head of Libya's state oil company, Mustafa Sanala, the facility should be operational within three years, and he expects an annual income of about 75 or so million dollars from this particular project. The project was first announced back in the early 80s. It was put on hold, however, for years before being revived in 2017. We hope this project will be beneficial and will encourage people in the south to stay in their lands instead of moving to the cities, making a reverse migration. This project should not be used by smugglers, since smuggling left a lot of bad impact on Libya. It's the responsibility of everybody, especially the local residents in the south, to take care of this project and preserve it. Now, not so long ago, travellers missing their flights were a pretty common occurrence given the heavy traffic along Uganda's main road to the country's international airport. But now a 51-kilometre-long expressway that links Kampala to Entebbe has slashed travel time significantly. Leon Sanyange has that story. I'll be there. David Molindwa is off to pick up a client. The tour and travel manager has to drive over 30 kilometres to the main airport. In previous years, an early departure was always necessary. Having to drive uh, tourists from Entebbe or having to drop tourists to Entebbe airport who have to catch a flight in a, a given time. And you estimate that, okay, maybe in an hour we'll be in Entebbe or we'll be in Kampala. But uh, reaching the road from nowhere jam, the road is packed. Molindwa now has little to worry about. The recently commissioned Entebbe Kampala Express Highway gives him easy access to his destination. This highway stretches from the outskirts of the capital Kampala to the main international airport in Entebbe. What used to be a two hours long journey now takes about 30 minutes. Entebbe Airport is Uganda's major international airport. It also serves as the main entry point into the country. The new highway heading in and out of the airport was officially opened in 2018. It features 19 overbridges and 18 underpasses to provide access to nearby towns. When you use the express, you don't have to go back to the city if you don't have to, anything to do there, you are, you are bound to Western Uganda. You just connect through the express uh, highway and then you are on your destination. The $476 million road project was jointly funded by the government of Uganda and the Exim Bank of China. The project took six years to complete and it has transformed both the roadways and the surrounding landscape. When you drive through the express highway, you can see the amount of infra infrastructure that people have put up, basically or mainly because of the, of the road itself. The government says motorists will start paying road tolls later this year. For Mulindwa, whether it is a pickup or a drop-off, the highway is already saving him time and money. Leon Senyange, CGTN, Entebbe, Central Uganda.
Let's head up north. A trio of Egypt's state-owned banks have launched a $65 million fund to support fintech startups. Now, the creation of the fund follows the recent adoption of a new law by Egyptian legislators, which sees emerging fintech tools as a way of expanding financial inclusion in the Arab world's most populous nation. Here's Sajitian's Yasser Kim with the details. It's a shot in the arm for Egypt's startup ecosystem. The 1 billion Egyptian pounds, which is an equivalent of $65 million, is meant to target emerging fintech startups, and especially those that are in the initial stages. The fund is being established by the National Bank of Egypt, Bank Misr and Bank du Caire, under the watch of the central bank, and will support both local fintech startups and international outfits that want to establish themselves in the Egyptian market. These startups face many issues, especially with financing their projects plus other complications. The fund will help these companies grow. The banks have strong liquidity to pour more than the 1 billion Egyptian pounds. The youth have many innovative ideas and digital solutions that we have to make good use of. And this fund will help in this purpose. There are a couple of success stories such as Fauri e-payments, which became the first unicorn in the North African country but experts believe there's potential for much more. The impact of this fund will be big. It will nurture the talent we have. For instance, a country like India, where the youth work in software and financial technology, they export billions of dollars from this sector and rake in huge revenue. We have qualified, well-educated youth. Their talent is big, but unfortunately, they don't find the proper climate or tools to develop their services and products that allows them to take off. The fund will provide them with the suitable environment to produce innovative applications in this field. Besides the fintech fund, the Central Bank of Egypt has amended regulations to attract Egyptians into the financial sector. Anyone can now open e-wallets, transfer cash through their mobiles and sell products via contactless smartphone payments. Two months ago, if you wanted to withdraw cash, you had to go to the bank or an ATM machine with your visa card. Now, any point of sale in any kiosk can do the same service. There are about half a million point of sale terminals and they're increasing. What do people want? Speed, ease of transactions, high security and less costs. All this is provided by fintech and financial services. The adoption of the new laws is expected to boost financial inclusion in the wider population, a key driver of investor interest in the fintech industry. These efforts are meant to achieve financial inclusion. We have about 40 to 50 million youth who use the internet but don't have bank accounts. Financial technology puts them under the state's digital umbrella. Inclusion means everyone will have an account, if not a bank account. They love an account through a mobile application that will eventually lead them to open a bank account. The central bank says through such initiatives, it hopes to transform Egypt into a regional hub for the financial technology industry. Yasser Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. Away from the continent, China has managed to become the only country with positive growth in imports from the United States. U.S. exports to China increased by 17% year-on-year in 2020. Global exports fell by 13%. China stepped up its agricultural product imports since the start of 2020, while pork and cotton imports hit a record high last year, even during the last quarter of 20, the first quarter rather of 2020, when the U.S. economy contracted by nearly 5%. Exports to China are estimated to have supported over 60,000 jobs in Mississippi in 2019, according to a report from the U.S.-China Business Council. On our story for you, it's the fourth day of a national, holiday, national day holiday in China. Consumers of the air appear to be spending big in the first half of the Golden Week. Data from China Union Pay to credit payment giant shows that online transactions surged to about $15 billion during the first three days of the holiday. Average daily transactions are up by over a third on a yearly basis during the three-day period. Spending on tourism and catering products shows substantial growth, but car rentals, car rentals are the biggest winner. Sales up more than 50% compared to a year ago. That's because more people chose short-distance travel over much longer ones. Box office receipts have also been surging. The seven-day holiday seen as one of the biggest revenue earners for the film industry in China. Revenues from cinema visits went up to nearly $400 million in the first four days of that holiday. 
I'll leave you there for the time being, but we'll be back at the top of the hour. Oil will be our focus when we return. The meeting of OPEC ministers today was pretty interesting. They decided basically to stay the course, keep to their production increase of 400,000 barrels a day. But the market responded by having Brent hit $82 a barrel. WTI across the Atlantic hit similar records. So where exactly do we go from here? We'll have answers for you live from London at the top of the hour. See you then. For now, back to Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And we still have more news for you here in the programme. Here's what's ahead. We'll be heading to South Africa for a silent party that is helping beat coronavirus, a pandemic blues. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys, the greatest sights, the greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. A silent disco with a beautiful view is becoming popular in South Africa. The event sees dozens of people dancing on a mountain top park. The budding urban craze spawned from the coronavirus pandemic. Nokutula Shabalala has more. This is Northcliffe, a residential area tucked in the leafy northern suburbs of Johannesburg. Dozens of people flock here to watch the sun go down while listening to music on headphones. It's described as the silent disco. And it's been helping many beat the blues during the coronavirus pandemic and tough containment measures. The idea behind the silent disco was created for people that are not into clubs. People just want to watch the sunset. It's a different asylum, a different kind of people. South Africa was hardest hit on the continent by COVID-19. The country's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, last week eased national restrictions to the lowest level ever, allowing larger gatherings. So, so basically anything is fine. The gig um, industry or the nightlife industry also has to evolve to be able to accommodate people because people still want to do it. As you can see, there's still a demand of good music, being out with my friends and still dancing, you know. So I think the idea is just to be able to create something that speaks to the people now. Revelers dance away the day in the open air while enjoying a 360-degree panoramic view of the city from one of the highest points in Johannesburg. The silent disco is a perfect space to unwind and be social for people who are very hesitant about going into clubs and indoor spaces. I think this was super cool. I've never seen this kind of concept in South Africa, so I think it was actually pretty nice. The music is really good, like the DJs are really doing a great job. And yeah, I definitely look forward to doing this again. I think it was really cool. After two years, it feels like we haven't partied before. <laughs> it feels so good to be out. It really, really does. It just feels like on top of God's garden. That's what it is. Organizers are observing government measures put in place to curb the spread of COVID-19. They are also encouraging people to get jabbed. Vaccinated revelers get to enjoy the disco at a discounted rate. Noctula Shabalala, CGTN. Well, let's now take a look at your sports news. Here's what's ahead. We'll be delving into Cameroon's inroads into growing the profile of disabled sport in the country. How would you create your legend? On the fields. On the tracks. In the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours?
Sports Scene. Find your game. Africa Live. Find your voice. Life for people living 